come and present uh, its own research. And the uh, Ipsos report indicated that the EFF brand has exited the brand Julius Malema. Therefore, it has now taken form and shape of a national organization. So I don't have to do 10, 15 meetings per day because we now have leaders who understand and appreciate what needs to be done. So when I was doing all of those community meetings, and many of them was in a way to workshop in a practical way uh, the lower structures and the collective leadership of the EFF because uh, we had, before EFF, you know, consumed a lot of experience uh, politically and organizationally. Mm. You're very big on accountability. I wonder, uh, given your last electoral show in 2019, what is your expectation for this year? What figure would, it, would it be a failure for you and what would be a success for you? Well, the failure will be to be below DA and uh, the success will be to get an outright majority where we govern South Africa in a manner that we think it will benefit the people of South Africa. Can we speak a little bit about the manifesto? It's a big, extensive and very detailed document. Maybe you can speak to some of the priority areas for you and maybe just touch particularly on economic policy and the thinking in that, in that sense on the effort. Well, uh, our manifesto six jobs because we believe that um, the population of South Africa, especially more than half of the youth, are unemployed. And without employment and uh, living wages, um, this country's economy is not sustainable. So we need to create jobs through industrialization. We need to create jobs through um, beneficiation. We have a lot of minerals in the South African country and the continent itself. Um, so beneficiation will go a long way in creating jobs. And you need to create tax incentives and other benefits for those who are prepared to go and open factories and industries outside uh, of Gauteng into the new economic development zones that uh, would identify um, as the EFF. Um, so. We are very big on, on jobs because we believe that if we create a state security-owned company, we'll cut a lot of middlemen. In South Africa, for a person to be a security guard, there has to be a middleman who goes and look for this guy and then present the guy to the government and the government pays the middleman to pay the actual worker. And we realize that in the process, there is a lot of exploitation you pay 15,000 per guard, and the guard is given 3,500. So when you insource them, the same as cleaners and all of that, you've got a potential of creating a lot of jobs in less than six months by just taking over the security guards that look after government facilities and public facilities and properties. Uh, so uh, we believe that that can be another immediate intervention we need to fill all the vacancies in government because most of these people are acting and when you act, you don't bring about the full confidence and it affects your performance. We also are very big on the land question. Uh, I think we have articulated our expropriation of land without compensation uh, several times. Um, and the understanding is that we make the state a custodian of the land. The same way we did when we took over in 1994 as black people. The minerals of South Africa used to belong to private multinational companies like Anglo-American and all of that. Uh, and uh, when we passed the Minerals Act, uh, we made the state the custodian of the minerals and that everyone who wants to mine must apply. Uh, for a license and Anglo-American did not leave the country because we took the rights away from it. It is, we, what, whatever they had at the time, you keep that, but going forward, you can't just go about it without asking for permission. So we're seeking the same thing with the land, make the state custodian of the land, and then everybody else, this property belongs to whoever owns it, it's their property, but the land is not theirs. 
They don't, don't, you don't lose home, you don't lose anything. We want to then account for the whole of the land so that the remaining unused land can be allocated uh, to those who need the land. And unused land includes the existing farms where a person has got 15 hectare farm, but he's only working on the five hectare. And he has been like that and has got no in immediate uh, program to expand the using of the other remaining 10 hectares. So we need that uh, to be given to people who will use it in the immediate for food security, for settlement, for agricultural purposes. Because in South Africa, the struggle started with the land. And if you are not going to give the people the land, everything else we are doing is pretentious. Because one day we are going to have an unled revolution and nobody will have control over those unruly characters. And unled revolution is anarchy. And you don't want to uh, have anarchy. I mean, why would people sit comfortably, comfortably this side of Santin and across the road there is Alexandra where people are landless and are squashed and living like sardines and you don't see anything wrong with that. And then one day when those people, they don't have to hire buses, they, don't, they just have to stand up from there and come here and say we've had enough. We, we too want to stay where there are toilets, where there are schools, where there are clinics, where uh, there is road uh, and security. So let's give the people the land. It is not true that when you say the people must be given the land, uh, investors are going to be very scared. That Mall of Africa is built on the land of the Maya family. Water, uh, water, waterfall. There, there's a huge development in Midrand here. Yeah huge, of huge houses, not owned by illiterates, not owned by poor people, clever, educated people who know what they are doing. They went to lease the land for 100 years from one family. But when we say lease it from government, they've got a problem with that. But they can lease it from one family for 100 years lease. Land tenure, yes, is very important. People must be guaranteed. This land will be used for this purpose for so many years. But what is worse in a waterfall in Midrand Johannesburg is that once the 100 years finishes, your children will not have a right to inherit that land. They too will have to go and get into new lease and new payments of uh, their own because uh, that's not your land. So this artificial outcry, it's imaginary, it's a swarkhafar, it's a fear mongering. It's not real. Um, every big development done in South Africa in any economic development zones, big Uha or any other one you want to mention, all of that investment is put on a state land. They don't own the land where there is huge development on it economic development zones that, that were created by President Mbeki and subsequent presidents who came after him. Those pieces of land are not owned by the people who have put a lot of billions in developing uh, those pieces of land. So this imaginary thing that wants to keep black people in perpetual landlessness, we're not going to buy into it. The last point, there are many issues I can say, but the load shading, security of uh, uh, energy supply, is it's, it's one thing that is highly uh, on the table of the EFF. And we can stop load shading in less than a year. We need to engage in converting our people from using electricity into gas, especially for cooking and heating. They are gas geysers now. If you go and look at how many uh, electricity do we waste on heating? How many electricity do we uh, waste on cooking? 
you'll realize that we can actually relieve the greed of serious pressures just from heating and cooking alone. Um, we, as government, are supposed to approve the new development, including plans of building new houses. So it can be a rule that anyone who builds a new house, there must be a gas electric, I mean, a gas um, cooking stove. Uh, uh, by that, already, you will release uh, the grid from this unnecessary pressure. We are for a mixed um, electricity supply, we are for the green, but we will never leave our coal for no alternative. If you say to me, shut down um, a, a power station, a coal power station of 100 megawatts, the alternatives must give me 100 megawatts before I close my 100 megawatts. Otherwise, I'm not going to do that. I, I close my 100 megawatts relying on what? On wind. What if there is no wind for the next two months? What's going to happen to me? So I can't do that. We need to also uh, service the existing power stations uh, optimally. And we need to know that when we fix and service this uh, power stations, when we close this one, we should have for, uh, for service and maintenance, we should have generated sufficient reserve to an extent that when we close this one for maintenance, we'll not get into a load shedding. But also conclude Kusile and Midupi. Uh, how do you have the so-called new power stations which don't have all the units operating. If this unit operates, the other one has collapsed. Uh, the other time it was even a, a structural problem, which is a confirmation of poor workmanship and corruption. Since 1994, we only built two, and the prices have gone uh, mad, like billions of friends have been spent on those power stations, yet you are still, you are not in a position where you can pride yourself uh, as a country that we have built a new powerful uh, coal power stations. And that power station has got the latest technology, yet we are building it now as if we are building it uh, during uh, the Stone Ages. So uh, we, we need a leadership that will do that and fight corruption in ESCOM in an extreme manner because one of the things that have uh, put us where we are is corruption in ESCOM and cater deployment of people who don't have the necessary qualification. Nothing wrong with cater deployment. They do it in America and everywhere else. They don't call it cater deployment. They're not even open about it. The problem is when you deploy people who don't have qualifications. Um, education must be free uh, from uh, uh, early childhood development until you obtain um, uh, your first degree um, and those who perform very well there must be scholarship for them to pursue their education precisely because education is at the center of any economic development if we're not going to educate these people, decolonized African education, if we're not going to educate these people, we're not going anywhere. President Mandela messed us up in 1994. We didn't need RDP houses in 1994. We needed free education. We're going to be building our own houses now. If he had given us free quality education in 1994, we're going to be working and building our own houses. And there will not be a need for social grants. There will not be a need for 350 that they give to the unemployed people who majority of them have not gone to school. So um, um, we want to achieve sustainable development. We have to give children free education. And in South Africa, we must give them mathematics, not math literacy, that mathematics that is going to be uh, compulsory. So every time I speak about giving people mathematics, they say I didn't pass mathematics. Why does he want to give it to other people? 
if I get HIV because I didn't use protection and I say to you, use protection, well, you say, no, you've got HIV, you can't tell me about using protection. Only fools will argue like that. So the fact that I didn't pass mathematics doesn't mean mathematics is not a very important subject. Um, it, it, ma it makes you to have the ability to think. A principal of mine said to me when I was demanding that history must be compulsory, uh, because I thought I was being revolutionary and then we need to remove mathematics because it was compulsory in my school. He said to me, you don't have to pass it. You just have to do it because everything else you do in your life is calculations. Now, Fervood says don't give black people mathematics. What are they going to do? What are they going to use it for? He was right because the top jobs were reserved for white people. And mathematics means top jobs. And we were not going to get math top jobs even if we have mathematics because we are black. So you are wasting their time. Don't give them mathematics. Freedom and democracy should mean giving your people that which the Boers denied them. If the Boers said don't give them mathematics, 1994 should have meant we're now giving them mathematics. Everything that the Boers said black people don't deserve. That's what freedom meant. We should have given them that. Last point is crime. We have a serious problem of crime. Uh, partly because we have somehow uh, disempowered our law enforcement. People point guns at law enforcement. Law enforcement, when you call them, there is an attack, there is a crime being committed. They ask, is there guns? Is there blood? And they are scared for their own lives because they know if they go there and defend themselves they are still going to be uh, treated somehow um, and I was very happy with Mukwanazi's job in KZN now where he killed a lot of dangerous criminals who were pointing guns at law enforcement officers and I had some journalists writing that the excessive force by the police is unacceptable you cannot argue like that now when we are under attack. Our murder rate in South Africa uh, surpasses the murder rate of areas where there is war, as if we are in a war. So because we are not in a war, but criminals have declared war against us, we need to respond in a military way to stop them because we have been speaking for, to them and they're taking advantage of us. Today in South Africa, Law-abiding citizens live in fear and criminals live in a happy environment. No criminal has got high walls because they are not scared. But the people who comply with the law are scared. So we must make the people who comply with the law to demolish high walls and enjoy their gardens and the views of their beautiful houses. And we need to make the criminals scared. Your current assessment, uh, 49 days away from the election, are we heading for uh, a situation in which no party has an outright majority? What is your current assessment? Well, I don't think the ANC will get anything beyond 40%. Um, and I think they have somehow you know, accepted that fate. I mean, Mbalula, when he became the Secretary General of the ANC, said... Um, the ANC will not get 35%. And then there was noise about it. He says, no, 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 I was giving an example. But the guy is a very honest guy. If you find him in, on his happy day, he will tell you the truth. He was giving us what they actually found internally when they were doing their own research, that you'll be very lucky if you pass 50% mark. Um, Ipsos said to the EFF, you are neck on neck with the DA. We don't know what you are doing, but keep doing what you are doing. Uh, because by look of things, if nothing drastically uh, changes, you are going to pass the DA. And we're talking now sitting at 20-25% um, of the EFF and the DA at 14, 15 percent. So, 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 yeah. So, uh, basically, that's that's that. Uh, we use Ipsos 
um, as a research institute, we don't have any contractual relationship with them. We don't sanction any research on our behalf. We wait for them to release their own research, which is not sanctioned by us. And then we ask them to come and make a presentation to the EFF because we believe in science. So when they came to the EFF first time, we said to them, why should we believe you? Um, not first time, this year. Was it this year yes. or last year? Yeah. They said, we said, why should we believe you? You just go out there and I've never been asked by anyone who I'm going to, where do you do it? They say, when have we ever got you wrong? In which election year? So we said 2014, they said, you are right. 2014, that was your first time and no one knew this animal. All, all of us said all types of things about you. But since then, we never got you wrong. We've got every election prediction right on the EFF, on the DA, on the ANC. So we have no reason to, to doubt them. Yes. So just to kind of elaborate, ask on, on Stimbley's question. So say that ANC gets less than 40, 37 according to SRF. Uh, it's going to be a fragmented parliament, right? What would the structure look like? Who would be ruling? Well, it's a coalition government. It won't be a fragmented uh, parliament or government because, you know, the founders of our constitution uh, declared our democracy multi-party democracy, which meant that there must be different types of political parties in parliament and everywhere else. And these parties must have the ability to can work together in the best interest of our people based on the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. So the problem then began when the ANC was getting two-third majority and became arrogant and suffered from the sins of the incumbency. Because that's what absolute majority does. It corrupt. And it corrupt absolutely. So um, uh, uh, now uh, the South Africans are beginning to say, let's go back a bit and try to check if we don't give anyone an absolute majority, how will they conduct themselves? So coalition governments work. The problem is the ANC and the DA. They are too arrogant and understandably so. They tasted power. Now when they lose power and they must work in a, a coalition arrangement, it becomes so frustrating because they used to do as they wish. And uh, 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 the citizens are now saying, no, we are going to work together. So let's take Ikurlin, for instance, where the EFF uh, was in government. Ikurleni um, research was, uh, no, a study was released now. Ikurleni is one of the top three best performing municipalities under the EFF. I mean, in South Africa, uh, uh, Ikurleni is one of the best. But do you know that those special grants that are given to municipalities by national government, like for infrastructure, water infrastructure, the national government doesn't give money to Ikurlin because they say it's under the EFF. So now you, you, you want to undermine a, a, a citizens on the basis that a different party is so dislike out of egos. Uh, not out of anything. Um, you give money to DA government in, in Cape Town. Uh, you give Mtlatuzi in uh, KZN under the IFP. When it comes to EFF, no. Why? The EFF is the only organization that poses a serious threat against the ANC. And that's why they know when we took over Igruleni with them in government, it didn't take us three months to outshine them. And they said, we want out of this coalition. What was the problem? They said, these guys are outshining us. If we continue with this, the movement will be history in Igurlin. They didn't care. One of the ANC councillors we went to unblock a sewer, a, a what councillor, in a what council, in a what governed by the ANC council. We went to unblock a sewer. She went to fight with an MMC of the EFF. 
stopping you from unblocking the sewer. Why would you stop someone to unblock the sewer? So they were seeing that as outshining them. So it's more politics of personality and egos than politics of the, of the coalition. And the EFF not being so obsessed with power. When we wanted to bring down the ANC, which we did successfully, in 2016, we gave these local municipalities to DA and said, govern them without us being involved. Um, and then subsequently we said, now we want to participate. The DA said, you can't participate. So we had to look for people who said, okay, you can participate because it's also important for us to accumulate uh, experience. So uh, uh, it's going to be a coalition government where power is going to be shared, um, especially amongst political parties that share uh, certain principles. They may not be all of them. But there will be some areas of uh, commonality uh, which we agree on, and then we'll go into government. Michelle, you said recently that the condition that you would put to the ANC would be for the finance minister to be the deputy president of the EFF. Is that correct? They may not no, but I, don't, <laughs> I don't think the your companies were listening to me. So the story was. Do you want to become a pres deputy president at all costs? Yes. Referring to me. Yes. That your name, is it a deal breaker? Mm -hmm. I said, I know power uh, uh, and I know glory. And I don't confuse glory to be power. So I can still run the agenda of the EFF without being in government. But if you don't give me deputy president, don't give me president, you have to give me finance. Which is what we did in Ikurile. We said, okay, that you can do whatever, but give us finance. And then we'll show you what we're made of. Because South Africa's problem uh, is the Department of Finance, which is not aligned with a developmental state. Its agenda is to always ensure that the resources are allocated to those who control uh, the means of production and those who control uh, treasury. Our treasury is not controlled from Pretoria, it's controlled from, from uh, Stellenbosch. And uh, we know that a person like Floyd can be controlled from Stellenbosch. So it was in that context that uh, my name will never be a deal breaker. Um, I know that ANC now, uh, in the whole of South Africa, everyone uh, that every province actually of the ANC either the chairperson of the ANC or the secretary of the ANC they served under me as a president of the youth league so those are my boys and girls so they know that if this one gets to be put there none of them can bully me not even Balula can bully me so there is that aspect of generational jealousy and that not this one. And if that is the case, I'm prepared to step back and then allow you to constitute a government to the benefit of our people. I don't have to be a minister of anything powerful. Even if you put me a minister of sports, arts and culture, Sir Ramaphosa can't outshine me. In the next election, we will not go into a coalition. We will win it outrightly. You put us there, you make a terrible mistake because we will work in such a way that our people say, these are the people we deserve. And that's what we did in Ikuruleni, in Nelson Mandela, in Tequini, in Johannesburg. Where we work is now, what, more than a year. Not a single one MMC of the EFF has been accused of corruption. So what are the deal breakers, even if it's not related to... Well, the deal breakers is an expropriation of land without compensation. Mm. Um, it's a nationalization of mines. And How soon do these things happen after the constitution of the new government? Well, we must... Uh, we're not going to take land the Zimbabwean style or anything of that sort. We're going to do it the way we try to do it now, in this current administration, bring all South Africans on board allow them as the constitution dictate to make an input majority of them in the those uh, 
uh, hearings that we conducted said expropriate land without compensation and the ANC developed a cold feed. So no barrel of a gun, no anything. Nationalization of mines. It doesn't mean we're going to take Angulo's mines or going to take anyone's mine. It means the state-owned mining company that will be given a preference over the rest of other private companies unless the state says we're not interested in mining this. Why would a state-owned mining company be interested in mining gold in uh, Johannesburg? That's where the biggest hole of gold is and the deeper you go, the more expensive it becomes. So you can't have the state-owned mining company involved in such mining. But there is a platinum mine in Mukopane that is run by Anglo-American. They don't run, they don't mine for themselves anymore. They outsource the mining to other companies. But then they are mining themselves directly because the product is so profitable. You don't have to dig deep through small intervention and resources there and there, already you make money. They're like, this other one, we're running it ourselves. Those are the kind of assets that the state must mine without using a lot of money before it makes money. Botswana government owns 50% of uh, diamond in Botswana, not in Switzerland, not very far. Yeah stone throw away here by the same company called DBS which owns diamond in South Africa. It's refusing to give a government of South Africa 50%, but it can give the government of Botswana 50%. Why? What different, what, what kind of policy is that where, where you say, because you must say, I don't engage in such policies. They can't say that. Botswana government takes Botswana's children to the best schools in the world and give them a stipend. When I met the Botswana student in Washington, each one of them was getting 15,000 rand of stipend. My mother died a domestic worker. She never got more than 3,000. A student, because of the minerals of his or her country, she's able to get free education and still be paid for going to school. So we want to use our minerals because our way of collecting the um, um, the coffers for the state pass, it can't be through taxes alone. Yes, the taxes will be our base, but we need other methods to generate more money for the fiscals and develop, finance the social program. So you can get our royalties people. for mining, for instance? No, it's our company. We don't get royalties. We get profit. It's our company. We established, and you can't say state can't establish company. We established a company called SAA. We established a company called Dinel. We established a company called Transnet, Escom. They may have their problems now, but this were once one of the best run companies. And it's not correct that when a company is owned by the state, it's inherently incompetent and unproductive. If you go to a, a high courts now, and go and check how many companies are being liquidated. Today alone, you will not find less than 100 companies in the whole of South Africa were liquidated and they are private companies. There is no single state-owned company that got liquidated. So it's not true that when it is privately owned, it's inherently profitable and successful. So we need a corrupt, free government of men and women black and white, who are going, we're going to work with white people, by the way. They will work uh, with the EFF, be, not because they are white, because they've got the necessary skill to make this work. They will not be given preference over our black people because we want to redress the imbalances of the past. But no one is going to be taken to the sea. No one is going to be uh, killed. Uh, no one is going to lose his or her property on the basis of color. So, and that's why the problem started. When fools took over government and then got a, a, a teacher, who, who, a history teacher, to come because he's a sad member, he can sing a mantra slogans more than others, 
They say, no, we need to make this guy head of technical services. The, the, the water doesn't come, sewer is blocked. He doesn't know what is technical. He knows Jan van Riebeck arrived here in 1652. That's what he knows. There was a white man there who knows this thing. God removed without an alternative. In the EFF government, we are going to fetch those old madalas and say, come back here. You are going to work here in a contract of so many years. This because you are mentoring this one. We are not in a war where, where the enemy is defeated. No, we are in a political contestation. And your defeat does not mean enmity. It means South Africans prefer this one now. But let's work together and make South Africa a good place for all of us. I was reading your newsletter, um, latest newsletter, yeah. and in that you mentioned that um, you know, the policy should be such that aspirations of the people aren't sidelined by narrow fiscal objectives. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I mean, do you, for example, mean that you won't care about the fiscal deficit, for instance? No, no, we do care about uh, fiscal deficit, and uh, we want to make sure that we reduce the debt so that we are able to channel a lot of uh, resources uh, uh, to our social development. But it is important that that doesn't become something that is the only consideration. We are going to make sure that the resources of this country are protected through reducing corruption. And when you reduce corruption, uh, your fiscal capacity increases and you are able to service the debt. But there is a debt that we've got a problem with. Um, and that is an apartheid debt. Where apartheid went to fetch money to come and buy guns to kill us. Now the World Bank and the IMF says we must pay for the guns that were meant to kill us. It's a matter that when we take over at this government, we will be able to take it to uh, ICJ, International Court of Justice, so that that debt can be declared illegal. It is unfair, it is inhuman to ask people to finance their own debt. So the fiscal policy is very important, but it can't be the only consideration uh, by the state. And how much of debt are we talking about here? Like this debt that you mentioned? Which one? The, the debt that you mentioned, that you just mentioned, that you will take to the ICJ. How much of debt? No, no, I'm saying I don't know how much the apartheid debt is now, but okay. there is an apartheid debt that we are still servicing um, as we speak. The and, and it's okay. part of the bad debt that we accumulated after. Uh, so as the debt is as big as it is now, we are including the apartheid debt. Can I just ask on policy, when you speak, I'm reminded of uh, Chris Hani on this mm. day, of Peter Mugaba, even Nelson Mandela, uh, in the policies that matter to the EFF. So I found a lot of convergence with the ANC, which makes me then wonder that in an arrangement where you have a power sharing agreement with the ANC, where is it that you differ? And I also ask it in the context of uh, this almost scaremongering that if the ANC and the EFF come together, it's going to be a disaster. But the policies seem to be the same. So what is it, maybe is it about you and his tunes that makes people to be worried? What is it? Or is it that you, you see you're looked at as activists? Mm -hmm. Is that what is concerning investors? Sorry. Well, uh, we don't have any differences with the ANC on policy. We went to inherit the 1912 ANC policy on the land question, for instance. So we are we, the EFF went back to the originality of the revolution and the struggle against colonialism and apartheid. So we went in there with an understanding that the ANC was drifting away from a progressive left to the right, especially after the adoption of uh, GIA and neoliberal policies that were pro-privatization and profit maximization. And we had a problem with that. So we cannot talk like we are the ones who started these things. 
like you're speaking of Chris, like you're speaking of uh, Peter yeah, and Nelson, Winnie, we inherited this struggle from them. It's not our struggle. Uh, we, have, we, we are yet to fight our own battles of uh, a must fall, of uh, one youth, one iPad. Those are going to be new struggles. But we are stuck in the past because the past has not been resolved. And we cannot make progress if we don't resolve the past. The, 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 the difficulty is in personalities. Because the ANC goes to a conference in 2017 and adopt the similar policies of the EFF on nationalization of the reserve bank, nationalization of mines, expropriation of land without compensation, establishment of state-owned bank, and all of that. We are in agreement. Then they go and elect wrong leadership, which will not implement these policies. And that's where the problem is. They are led by a man who is co-opted by the white monopoly capital and the controllers of the economy of South Africa. And because the man has been compromised so much, right, he's unable to even implement decisions of his own organization. He was elected, Sir Ramaphosa was elected under a resolution, expropriation of land without compensation. In 1944, when the Youth League was formed, it seeked to radicalize the ANC and adopted something called Program of Action. Took that Program of Action to the ANC conference in 1949. The ANC adopted that radical uh, Program of Action, which included Amstrake. Then they looked at Lutuli, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and all. They said, this is not the correct leadership to can implement this militant program. Removed them and elected uh, Moroga as a president. Moroga joined the ANC at the door because they were disparate to get anyone who's a doctor to remove, uh, no, not, not, uh, not to remove Kuma, not, uh, not Lutuli. So they removed Kuma, put Moroga. But Tambo, Sisulu, Mandela and them went into that leadership as well to safeguard the resolutions of the 1949 Conference of the ANC, which led to the formation of Amtsdrage. So you, you cannot take these militant and radical resolutions and then elect neoliberal leadership to implement progressive left positions. So... That's where we are. And uh, they will see to finish themselves. We are going to put the demands there. And I will remind them and say, these are your resolutions. Let's see how do we move forward. I'm just curious, what are those demands then before uh, Ramaphosa to step down if you were to form a coalition? Is, is, is their own call. Um, look, Ramaphosa, like any of them, is not my uh, preferred cup of tea, but... Um, if we agree on, on, on principles, which is what should matter the most than personalities, if we say these are the resolutions, and then who are the best leadership from the parties that have agreed on this to take these resolutions forward? So the first thing is not leadership, it's principles. Once we agree on principles, and by the way, when we're negotiating the was it 2021? 2021 elections. We had agreed with the ANC on almost everything, including changing of uh, the national anthem where we remove this term. So when you say you are removing this term, people think you are removing Africans. It's not Africans. This term is an apartheid song which was sang when our people were being butchered and killed uh, in the, all the camps that uh, they were uh, taken to. So you cannot ask the Jews to sing the songs of Hitler. They will, you won't even attempt that. But we are being asked to sing a song that was sang when our people were tortured. Can you imagine how much trauma we instill in those people that have gone through that in Flag Plus? In Flag Plus, the apartheid, Eugene Dukok, 
apartheid general used to put them in cages, beat them uh, half dead, leave them in there, go outside that cage, brine meat. As you hear the smell of meat under pain and hunger, they get drunk and they sing this them. There are people who survived those camps. And today they must still sit in a stadium and they are told, sing that song that they were singing when they were torturing. They in Seattle agree that doesn't even need a constitutional amendment. It's the president who decides what becomes the national anthem. We've compromised so much. Uh, 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 and some of the things are not even so fundamental. We've, how do you put in public the statues of apartheid generals? Because in public should be statues of people we celebrate. That's why our children will grow up to fear these people. That These are the people who beat them up and then they still put them in the public parks, in the public display, in a celebratory manner. We're not saying destroy them. Take them to the apartheid museum. Because every town in South Africa has got a statue of an apartheid general. Every town. Apartheid was declared crime against humanity. So anything that says uh, apartheid is a good thing uh, without saying, but by display, should be declared uh, unacceptable in, in our society. Um, Mr. Manama, a mm. markets reporter. Um, I'm interested to know your reflections on how investors um, may take some of the things you're putting on the table. Uh, they all make sense. I mean, you're drawing from other countries, other leaders. You've obviously done the homework, but what markets don't like is uncertainty. So I'm curious about whether you thought around what the strategy might be, um, assuming you come into quite an influential position, how you manage um, that perception that what you're introducing is potentially more radical than what it may actually be in a way. Well, investors um, always invest where they can make uh, money. So, for instance, in a war-torn country where there is blood diamond, investors go and fetch blood diamond and find a way of cleaning it. So we cannot speak about investors as if they are some high moralist people who uh, don't want to engage in this and that. What any investor wants is a clear policy as to what is the policy, not speaking in folk tongues, they want to understand and then they look at that policy and say how do i make profit out of this will i still be be able to make a profit and then from there the investor looks at infrastructure is the infrastructure in a good condition to an extent that it will allow us to move our people and goods uh, speedily and in a safer manner will we get a reliable electricity supply Will we get reliable water supply? Uh, what are the taxes of the country? And then from there you say, what is the security of that country in terms of crime? Will we have a problem of crime? Uh, am, I, am I not going to invest my things? And then the next thing, I wake up, my yellow machines, I'm told, uh, I've taken over by army general. This general is now in charge uh, of what I've invested. All of that, once satisfied, investors leave politics to politicians because they know they will still make money. So um, I just told you about uh, DBS investment in Botswana where the government takes 50% of... Uh, of the profit. So what can you do? Uh, it's not about po po policy of uh, non-state interference. It's about if the government takes 50%, will I still make profit? And if the answer is yes, they go like, government is the most reliable partner you want, by the way, when you're engaged uh, in business. So uh, no investor can 
actually leave South Africa on the basis of what I said. Because they should have left China by now. Just to jump back in, yeah. so would it be fair to say in a way that what you are proposing to investors is that you're going to give them, let's say in a way, clearer direction in terms of policy? Because some of the feedback um, on current policy, for example, is that it's good, but not necessarily implemented correctly, or that people don't stick to what they say. Are you saying that? what you're offering or proposition to investors is just more transparency perhaps and just a firmness like this is what we've decided this is how we're going to do it this is how we're going to act investors want to know they don't want to deal with amubas who are shapeless they want to know and that's their problem now with ramapos they're like the guy is indecisive we don't know where the guy stand it creates a lot of confusion so the markets don't want to be confused. They want to, you to know that if you say the apartheid debt is 28 billion, for instance, you have to say, they must know, okay, this guy is coming to fight uh, uh, 28 billion of the apartheid debt. And therefore, uh, uh, this is how uh, he's trying to put his fiscal policy. They know that. This is how we're going. The rest of the other debt, uh, he's willing to service it and ensure that there is still sufficient money for his uh, social uh, development uh, as a country. So we have a duty ourselves as a, as, a, as a leadership to speak straight to what we believe in as a policy of the country. And then from there, implement exactly what we spoke about. We must not speak left and walk right like we're doing with Palestine and Israel. Um, we pretend to be caring about the people of Palestine in terms of our foreign policy and that we are with the people of Palestine. Uh, we go to parliament, we pass a resolution, let the Israeli embassy be removed from South Africa until they've resolved their issues. A person goes to ICJ to apply for whatever things in ICJ because he knows the court process is going to take long. So let me buy myself time while they're still trying to find a solution. I can't remove the embassy of Israel. So when he speaks in respect of that policy, now you don't know where do we actually stand? Was it UAE now he said, uh, the cutting diplomatic ties. Brazil said we're cutting diplomatic ties. We will not be the first ones. But because of indecisive leadership that speaks uh, uh, in two tongues, no one hears what is this leadership say. We shall be the TV crew or just about ready for you, but just in closing, oh. Mike there in Cape Town just wants the last five minutes. Yeah, hi, Mr. Malema. I was wondering if you can just go into your crystal ball first and tell us, do you see the EFF in government after the election in some kind of power-sharing deal with the, with the ANC and with Mr. Maramaposa as president? And then could you tell us which countries you look to as examples for what South Africa could be that kind of have the similar kind of policy platform to the one that you're espousing? Thanks. Um, we are looking for a working relationship with any political party that is prepared to agree with the EFF on its non-negotiable uh, seven cardinal pillars. Uh, because we believe the EFF seven non-negotiable cardinal pillars are the ones that can deliver us uh, from economic bondage. Um, when the ANC comes with its own president. It is their own baby, it's not our own baby. Um, because you're going to say you don't want drama pause. And then they bring Paul Machatin. You don't want Paul Machatin. Then they bring Guedemantash of Busas. You don't want uh, Guedemantash. Then they bring Figile Mbalul. So. There's really no one 
I think if any person left there who can actually be a unifier and the supporters of apartheid Israel won't be comfortable with that, will be Nale Dipano. Uh, and I don't think it is something that they will be interested to, to pursue. So um, um, uh, we need to make sure that we bring about a proper leadership in this country, which is going to ensure that uh, we bring stability and uh, not be obsessed with factional and party political issues to the detriment of the country called South Africa.